So the symbol I'm going to talk about is gamma, little gamma, um, which gets used for lots of different things, but in this particular context I'm going to talk about it, its use in special relativity. Relativity is something that everyone is actually familiar with. It's the fact that the laws of physics are kind of the same in whatever reference frame you're in. So for example, when you're sitting on an aeroplane, unless you look out of the window, you're really not aware of the fact that you're traveling along at 500 miles an hour. But if you were to, you know, sitting there at your table to throw something up in the air, a ball up in the air, it would just fall back down again and so on. The laws of physics are basically the same, even though you're moving relative to the Earth at high speed. And what special relativity says is that all the laws of physics are basically the same in any reference frame that's moving at constant speed. And when you work through the maths of all that and what that actually implies, one of the quantities that sort of comes out all over the place is, is the, the, the same mathematical expression comes out all over the place, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, where v is the speed at which the reference frame is moving and c is the speed of light. And this comes up so often that it's actually given its own symbol. It's called gamma. It is a, it's a symbol that occurs all over the place in special relativity. For example, one of the places it occurs most blatantly is a thing called time dilation, which is that if you're in a reference frame which is moving along at speed v, it turns out that your clocks move more slowly than things that are stationary relative to you. So in fact, if you were to just watch the speed at which the time was ticking away on a clock in, a, in something that's moving, like a rocket moving at some velocity v, it actually moves more slowly um, than the clocks that are stationary. And the factor by which it moves more slowly is 1 over gamma. And so, for example, if you put the numbers in, for something traveling at 90% of the speed of light, when you plug them into that formula for gamma, gamma comes out at about 2, a bit over 2. And so that means that something moving at 90% of the speed of light, the clocks there will be traveling at about a factor of 2 slower than those that are stationary. This sounds very bizarre, right? Because people are used to the idea that clocks are just clocks, and as long as they're behaving themselves, they should all tick at 1 second per second. And this idea that the rate at which time progresses depends on what reference frame you're in is, is pretty bizarre. But there's very strong experimental evidence that it actually really works. Um, one of the simplest experiments is, it turns out that there are particles crashing into the Earth's atmosphere, crashing into the top of the Earth's atmosphere, sort of 40 or 50 kilometers up. Um, and when they crash into the Earth's atmosphere, these cosmic rays smashing into the atmosphere turn into muons. You create muons. Now, it turns out muons as a particle have very short lifetimes, an elementary particle that decays very quickly. And so they don't actually, in the time between them being created, they actually will decay before they get to the ground. Even traveling at close to the speed of light, they don't have time to get to ground level. And so in the absence of special relativity, you would predict that you should never detect any of these muons if you have a muon detector on the ground. Because although they're being created up there, they don't actually have time to travel all the way to the ground. But because they're traveling at close to the speed of light, that means that their internal clocks are going slower. And when your clocks are going slower, everything goes slower including this process of radioactive decay, that these particles actually decay more slowly than they would do if they were just sitting stationary in the lab, which means they actually do have time to get all the way from where they're created, tens of kilometers up, down to ground level. So if you have a muon detector in the lab, you can actually detect these cosmic ray muons, even though in the absence of special relativity, none of them should ever have made it all the way from the top of the atmosphere to the ground. And nine, we have ignition sequence start. So there's probably the most famous story of this uh, associated with this effect of time dilation is this thing called the twins paradox, which is that if you were, if you start with a pair of identical twins and you send one of them off on a rocket ship to Alpha Centauri um, and they go off at some fraction of a high, you know, high fraction of the speed of light, so they're traveling sufficiently close to the speed of light, you have to worry about these things. The one who travels away and goes off to Alpha Centauri and then comes back again, um, because they're moving, the person so who stays at home would see this person's clock traveling more slowly and so therefore by the time the twin who's gone to Alpha Centauri and then come back again gets back again they'll actually be younger than the twin who stayed at home. Now the reason why this is a paradox is because everything is relative which means now let's look at it from the twin's point of view who's on the rocket. From the twin's point of view who's on the rocket he just stayed in the rocket the entire time and from his perspective, the Earth shot off in the opposite direction for a while, and then when he turned around, the Earth shot back again. So from his perspective, he just stayed stationary, and the other twin, the one who stayed on Earth, did all the moving, moved backwards and came back again. And so by exactly the same argument, the twin who'd actually gone all the way to Alpha Centauri and back again would argue, actually, I've seen my twin doing travelling at high speed, so I would see my twin's clocks travelling more slowly, and therefore my twin should be younger than me. So that you end up with this paradox that each of them, by this argument of special relativity, will claim that they should then be younger than their, their, their twin. And the resolution to this paradox is because there isn't actually a symmetry in this situation, which is because the twin who actually did the journey at some point had to turn around and come back. 
And that means that the twin who did the journey didn't stay in the same reference frame the whole time. He was initially in one reference frame traveling one way and then later on was in another reference frame traveling the other way, which means at some point he must have accelerated, or decelerated to a stop and then accelerated back the other way. And as soon as you introduce acceleration into the mix of things, then special relativity doesn't work anymore. And if you really want to resolve this twin paradox properly, you have to consider general relativity, which is the, the version of relativity you have to use as soon as you have accelerations. So the one who would end up being younger is actually the one who went to Alpha Centauri and back, the, the ultimate resolution when you do the job properly.